Please subscribe my channel. Part 2 Acts Against the Party Chapter 5 A Political Act For days later he saw the girl with dark hair again. He was walking to the toilets at the Ministry of Truth and she was coming towards him. She had hurt her hand. She had probably hurt it on one of the story writing machines. It was a common accident in that department. The girl was about four meters away when she fell forwards. As she fell, she hit her hand again and cried out in pain. Winston stopped. The girl got to her knees. Her face had turned a milky yellow color, making her mouth look redder than ever. She looked at him and her face seemed to show more fear than pain. Winston felt a strange mix of emotions. In front of him was an enemy who was trying to kill him. In front of him, also, was a human being, in pain and perhaps with a broken bone. Already he had started to help her. He felt that her pain was in some strange way his own. You're hurt, he said that it's nothing. My arm. It'll be all right in a second. He helped her up that it's nothing, she repeated. Thanks, comrade, she walked away quickly. Winston was standing in front of a telescreen, so he did not show any surprise on his face, although it was difficult not to. As he had helped her up, she had put something in his hand. It was a piece of paper. He opened it carefully in his hand in the toilet, but did not try to read it. You could be certain the telescreens would be watching in the toilets. Back in his office, he put the piece of paper down on his desk among the other papers. A few minutes later he pulled it towards him, with the next job he had to do. On it, in large letters, was written. I love you, for the rest of the morning it was very difficult to work. At lunchtime in the canteen the fool Parsons, still smelling of sweat, did not stop talking to him about all the work he was doing for hate week. He saw the girl at the other end of the canteen, at a table with two other girls, but she did not look in his direction. In the afternoon he looked at the words I love you again and life seemed better. He believed her. He did not think she was in the thought police, not now. He wanted to see her again. How? How could he arrange a meeting? It was a week before he saw her again, in the canteen. He sat at her table and at that moment saw Uncle Forth, the dreamy man with hairy ears who rewrote poems. Uncle Forth was walking around with his lunch, looking for a place to sit down. He would certainly sit with Winston if he saw him. Winston had about a minute to arrange something with the girl. He started to eat the watery soup they had been given for lunch. What time do you leave work? He said to the girl. 18.30, where can we meet? Victory Square, near the picture of Big Brother. It's full of telescreens. It doesn't matter if there's a crowd. But don't come near me until you see me among a lot of people. And don't look at me. Just follow me. What time? 
19 hours. All right. Ampleforth did not see Winston and sat down at another table. Winston and the girl did not speak again and they did not look at each another. The girl finished her lunch quickly and left, while Winston stayed to smoke a cigarette. He arrived at Victory Square early. Big Brother's picture looked up at the skies where he had beaten the Eurasian aeroplanes, or East Asian aeroplanes, it had been a few years ago, in the Great Air War. Five minutes after the time they had arranged, Winston saw the girl near Big Brother's picture, but it was not safe to move closer to her yet, there were not enough people around. But suddenly some Eurasian prisoners were brought out and everyone started running across the park. Winston ran too, next to the girl, lost in the crowd. Can you hear me, she said. Yes. Are you working this Sunday afternoon? No. Then listen carefully. Go. Like a general in the army she told him exactly where to go. A half hour railway journey, turn left outside the station, two kilometers along the road, a gate, a path across a field. She seemed to have a map inside her head. Can you remember all that, she said, finally, yes. What time? About fifteen hours. You may have to wait. I'll get there by another way. She moved away from him. But at the last moment, while the crowd was still around them, a hand touched his, though they did not dare look at each other. Winston opened a gate and walked along the path across the field. The air was soft and the birds sang. Winston saw the girl near Big Brother's picture. You were not safer in the country than in London. There were no telescreens of course, but there were microphones and the thought police often waited at railway stations. But the girl was clearly experienced, which made him feel braver. He had no watch, but it could not be fifteen hours yet, so he started to pick flowers. A hand fell lightly on his shoulder. He looked up. It was the girl, shaking her head as a warning to stay silent. She walked ahead of him and it was clear to Winston that she had been this way before. He followed, carrying his flowers, feeling that he was not good enough for her. They were in an open space of grass between tall trees when the girl stopped and turned. Here we are, she said. He stood quite close to her but did not dare move nearer. I didn't want to say anything on the path because there might be microphones there. But we're all right here, he still was not brave enough to go near her. We're all right here, he repeated stupidly. Yes, look at the trees. They were small and thin. There's nothing big enough to hide a microphone in. And I've been here before. He had managed to move closer to her now. She stood in front of him with a smile on her face. His flowers had fallen to the ground. He took her hand until now I didn't even know what color your eyes were, he said. They were brown, light brown. 
And now you've seen what I'm really like, can you even look at me? Yes, easily, I'm 39 years old. I've got a wife that I can't get rid of. I've got a bad knee. I've got five false teeth, I don't care, said the girl the next moment she was in his arms on the grass. But the truth was that although he felt proud, he also felt disbelief. He had no physical desire, it was too soon. Her beauty frightened him. Perhaps he was just used to living without women, the girl sat up and pulled a flower out of her hair. Don't worry, dear. There's no hurry. Isn't this a wonderful place? I found it when I got lost once on a walk in the country with the Young People's League. If anyone was coming, you could hear them a hundred meters away. What's your name? asked Winston, Julia. I know yours. It's Winston, Winston Smith. Tell me, dear. What did you think of me before I gave you the note? He did not even think of lying to her. It was like an offer of love to tell her the truth. I hated the sight of you, he said. If you really want to know, I thought you were in the thought police. The girl laughed, clearly pleased that she had hidden her true feelings so well. She pulled out some chocolate from the pocket of her overalls, broke it in half and gave one of the pieces to Winston. It was very good chocolate, where did you get it? He asked Dotto, there are places, she said. It's easier if you seem to be a good party member like me. I'm good at games. I was a group leader in the spies. I work three evenings a week for the Young People's League. I spend hours and hours putting up posters all over London. I do anything they want and I always look happy about it. It's the only way to be safe. The taste of the excellent chocolate was still in Winston's mouth. You are very young, he said. You're ten or fifteen years younger than I am. What did you find attractive in a man like me? It was something in your face. I thought I'd take a chance. I'm good at finding people who don't belong. When I first saw you I knew you were against them. When Julia said them she meant the party especially the inner party. She spoke about them with real hate, using bad words. Winston did not dislike that. It was part of her personal war against the party. He kissed her softly and took her hands in his. Have you done this before? Of course. Hundreds of times, well, a lot of times. With party members? Yes, with members of the inner party. Not with those pigs, no. But there are plenty that would if they got the chance. They are not as pure as they pretend to be. His heart raced. He hoped that the party was weakened by a lie. Listen. The more men you've had, the more I love you. Do you understand that? Yes, perfectly you like doing this. I don't mean just me. I mean the thing itself. I love it, that was what he wanted to hear. 
The need for sex, not the love of one person, would finish the party. He pressed her down on the grass. This time there was no difficulty. Afterwards they fell asleep and slept for about half an hour. Their love, their sex together, had beaten the party. It was a political act. Chapter 6 They Can't Get Inside You Winston looked round the little room above Mr. Charrington's shop. As he had thought, Mr. Charrington had been happy to rent it to him. He did not even mind that Winston wanted the room to meet his lover. Everyone, he had said, wanted a place where they could be alone and private occasionally. They had taken the room because during the month of May they had made love only one more time. It's safe to meet anywhere twice, Julia had said. Then they had had to see each other in the street. In a different place every evening and never for more than half an hour at a time. The idea of having their own hiding place, indoors and near home, had been exciting for both of them. They were fools, Winston thought again. It was impossible to come here for more than a few weeks without being caught. But he needed her and he felt he deserved her. Julia was 26 years old. She lived in a party building with 30 other girls, always the smell of women. I hate women, she said, and she worked, as he had guessed on the store writing machines. She enjoyed her job, looking after a powerful electric motor. She was not clever and did not much enjoy reading, but she liked machinery. Life, as she saw it, was quite simple. You wanted a good time, they, meaning the party, wanted to stop you having it. So you broke the rules as well as you could. At that moment he heard her on the stairs outside and then she ran into the room. She was carrying a bag. She went down on her knees, took packets of food from the bag and put them on the floor. She had real sugar, real bread, real jam. All the good food that nobody had seen for years. And then. This is the one I'm really proud of. I had to put paper round it because, but she did not have to tell him why she had paper round it. The smell was already filling the room. It's coffee, he said softly. Real coffee, it's in a party coffee. There's a whole kilo here, she said, how did you get it? There's nothing those inner party pigs don't have. But of course waiters and servants steal things, and, look, I got a little packet of tea as well, Winston opened the packet. It's real tea, not fruit leaves. Yes, she said. But listen, dear. I want you to turn your back on me for three minutes. Go and sit on the other side of the bed. And don't turn round until I tell you. Winston looked out of the window. He listened to a woman singing outside with deep feeling. Winston thought she would be quite happy if that June evening never ended. He had never heard a member of the party sing like that, you can turn round now, said Julia. 
He turned round and for a second almost did not recognize her. He thought she had taken her clothes off. But the change in her was more surprising than that. She had painted her face. He thought the makeup must be from a shop in the pole area. Her lips were red, her face was smooth. There was even something under her eyes to make them brighter. It was not well done, but Winston did not know that. He had never before seen a woman in the party with makeup on. Julia looked prettier and much more like a woman. He took her in his arms. Do you know what I'm going to do next? She said. I'm going to get a real woman's dress from somewhere and wear it instead of these horrible overalls. In this room, I'm going to be a woman, not a party comrade. After they made love, they fell asleep. And when Winston woke up the hands on the clock showed nearly nine, twenty-one hours. He did not move because Julia was sleeping with her head on his arm. Most of her makeup was on the pillow or on him. They had never talked about marriage. It was impossible, even if Catherine died. Winston had told Julia about Catherine. She was good thinkful, in newspeak, unable to think a bad thought. She did not like sex. It was just, our duty to the party. Julia had said it for him. Just to have children. Children who would one day spy on their parents and tell the party if they said or did anything wrong. In this way the family had become part of the Thought Police. Catherine had not told the Thought Police about Winston only because she was too stupid to understand his opinions. You can turn round now, said Julia. Winston had thought about killing Catherine and once nearly did. But now he and Julia were dead. When you disobeyed the party you were dead. Julia woke up and put her hands over her eyes. We are the dead, Winston said. Doc, we're not dead yet, said Julia, pressing her body against his. Doc, we may be together for another six months, a year. When they find us there will be nothing either of us can do for the other. We will tell them everything, she said. Everybody always does. They make you feel so much pain. Even if we tell them everything, that's not a betrayal. The betrayal would only be if they made me stop loving you, she thought about that. They can't do that, she said finally. It's the one thing they can't do. They can make you say anything, anything, but they can't make you believe it. They can't get inside you, no, he said, a little more hopefully. No, that's quite true. They can't get inside you. I'll get up and make some coffee, she said. We've got an hour. What time do they turn the lights off at your flats? 23.30 It's 23 hours at the party building. But you have to get in earlier than that because, she suddenly reached down from the bed to the floor picked up a shoe and threw it hard into the corner of the room. What was it? He said in surprise. A rat. I saw his horrible little nose. There's a hole down there. I frightened him, I think, rats, said Winston quietly. In this room? 
they everywhere, said Julia, without much interest, as she lay down again. We've even got them in the kitchen at the party building. Did you know they attack children? In some parts of London a woman dare leave a baby alone for two minutes. The big brown ones are the worst. They? Stop. Stop, said Winston, his eyes tightly shut, dearest. You've gone quite pale. What's the matter? They are the most horrible things in the world, rats. She put her arms round him, but he did not reopen his eyes immediately. I'm sorry, he said. It's nothing. I don't like rats, that's all, don't worry, dear. We won't have the dirty animals in here. I'll put something over the hole before we go. Julia got out of bed, put on her overalls and made the coffee. The smell was so powerful and exciting that they shut the window, worried that somebody outside would notice it and ask questions. And they could taste the real sugar in the coffee, it was even better than the taste of the coffee itself. Julia walked round the room with one hand in her pocket and a piece of bread and jam in the other. She looked at the books without interest. She told Winston the best way to repair the table. She sat down in the old armchair to see if it was comfortable. She smiled at the old twelve-hour clock. How old is that picture over there, do you think, she asked. A hundred years old? More. Two hundred. But it's impossible to discover the age of anything these days. She looked at it. What is this place? It's a church. Well, that's what it used to be. When Winston got out of bed it was dark. The room was a world, a past world, and they were the last two people from it who were still living. Chapter 7 Our Leader, Emmanuel Goldstein they vaporized Syme. One morning he was not at work, a few careless people talked about his absence. On the next day nobody talked about him. His name disappeared from lists and newspapers. He did not exist. He had never existed. Parsons was helping to organize hate week. He was completely happy, running around painting posters, singing the new hate song. Smelling even more strongly of sweat in the hot weather. Daily life no longer caused Winston pain. He had stopped drinking gin at all hours and his knee felt better. He did not want to shout angry words at the telescreen all the time. He met Julia four, five, six, seven times during the month of June. It was so hot at the end of the month that they lay on the bed in the room over Mr. Charrington's shop without clothes on. The rat had never come back. Sometimes they talked about a more open war against the party, but they did not know how to begin. Winston told her about the strange understanding that seemed to exist between himself and O'Brien. He sometimes felt like going to see him, telling him he was the enemy of the party, demanding O'Brien's help. Strangely, Julia did not think this was a wild idea. 
She judged people by their faces and it seemed natural to her that the look in O'Brien's eyes made Winston believe in him. Also, she thought that everybody secretly hated the party. Although she did not believe in Goldstein and the Brotherhood, she thought the party had invented them and then at last it happened. All his life, it seemed to him, he had been waiting for this, there was a message from O'Brien. Winston was outside his office at the ministry when he heard a small cough behind him and turned. It was O'Brien, I was reading your Newspeak article the other day. You know a lot about Newspeak, I believe, though, not really. I've never invented any of the words, but you write it very well, said O'Brien. This is not only my own opinion. I was talking recently to a friend of yours who knows a lot about Newspeak. I can't remember his name at the moment. Winston's heart jumped. This could only mean sign. But Sime was not only dead, he was vaporized, an unperson. It was dangerous to talk about an unperson, they could kill you for it. O'Brien was sharing a thought crime with him. In your Newspeak article you used two words which we have recently taken out of the language, said O'Brien. Have you seen the new 10th edition? No, said Winston. We still have the 9th in the office. The 10th will not be sent to offices for some months, but I have one. Would you like to see it, perhaps? Yes, very much, said Winston, who could see where this was leading. You will be interested, I'm sure. You will like the smaller number of verbs. Shall I send someone to you with a dictionary? But I always forget that kind of thing. Perhaps you could collect it from my flat at a convenient time. Wait. Let me give you my address. They were standing in front of a telescreen which could see what he was writing. He wrote an address in a notebook, pulled out the page and gave it to Winston. I am usually at home in the evenings, he said. If not, my servant will give you the dictionary. And then he was gone. They had done it. They had done it at last. The room was long carpeted and softly lit, the sound from the telescreen was low. At the far end of the room O'Brien was sitting under a lamp with papers on either side of him. He did not look up when the servant showed Winston and Julia in. Winston's heart was beating fast. It was dangerous to arrive with Julia although they had met only outside O'Brien's flat. And although O'Brien had invited him, he was still afraid of the black uniformed guards in this enormous building with its strange smells of good food and tobacco. But the guards had not ordered him out. O'Brien continued to work and did not look pleased at the visit. It seemed quite possible to Winston that he had just made a stupid mistake. He could not even pretend that he had come only to borrow the dictionary if he had. Why was Julia here? O'Brien got up slowly from his chair and came towards them across the thick carpet. 
He pressed a switch on the wall and a voice from the telescreen stopped. Julia gave a small cry of surprise and without thinking Winston said, You can turn it off. Yes, said O'Brien. We can turn it off. We in the inner party are allowed to do that, nobody spoke. Without the voice from the telescreen the room was completely silent. Then O'Brien smiled. Shall I say it or will you? he said. I will say it, said Winston immediately. That thing is really turned off. Yes. We are alone. We are enemies of the party. Winston paused. He did not know exactly what he expected from O'Brien. Then he continued, We believe that there is a secret organization working against the party and that you are part of it. We want to join it and work for it. We are enemies of the party. We are lovers, and we are thought criminals. And now we are in your power. O'Brien took a bottle and filled three glasses with dark red liquid. It reminded Winston of something he had seen a long time ago. Julia picked up her glass and smelled the liquid with great interest. It is called wine, said O'Brien with a small smile. Not much of it gets to ordinary party members, I'm afraid. His face became serious again, and he lifted his glass, to our leader, he said. To Emmanuel Goldstein, Winston lifted his glass, wide-eyed. Wine was a thing he had read and dreamed about. For some reason he always thought it tasted sweet. But it tasted of nothing. The truth was that after years of drinking gin he could taste almost nothing. So Goldstein is a real person, he said. Yes he is, and he is alive. Where, I do not know, and the Brotherhood is real, too. It was not invented by the Thought Police. No, it is real. But you will never learn much more about the Brotherhood than that. He looked at his watch. It is unwise even for me to turn the telescreen off for more than half an hour. It was a mistake for both of you to arrive here together. And you, comrade, he looked at Julia, will have to leave first. We have about twenty minutes. Now, what are you prepared to do? Anything that we can, said Winston. O'Brien had turned himself a little in his chair so that he was looking at Winston. He seemed to think that Winston could answer for Julia. You are willing to give your lives? Yes, you are willing to murder another person? Yes, you are willing to cause the death of hundreds of innocent people? Yes, if, for example, it would help us to blind a child and destroy its face, would you do that? Yes? Are you willing to kill yourselves, if we order you to do so? Yes? You are willing, the two of you, to separate and never see each other again? No, shouted Julia. It seemed to Winston that a long time passed before he answered. No, he said finally, you did well to tell me said O'Brien. It is necessary for us to know everything. 
O'Brien started walking up and down, one hand in the pocket of his black overalls, the other holding a cigarette. You understand, he said, that secrets will always be kept from you. You will receive orders and you will obey them without knowing why. Later I shall send you a book by Emmanuel Goldstein. When you have read the book you will be full members of the Brotherhood. When you are finally caught you will get no help. Sometimes we are able to get a razor blade into the prison to silence someone, but you are more likely to tell them all you know, although you will not know very much. We are the dead. We are fighting for a better life for people in the future. He stopped and looked at his watch. It is almost time for you to leave, comrade, he said to Julia. Wait. There is still some wine. He filled the glasses and held up his own glass. What shall we drink to? To the death of Big Brother? To the future? To the past, said Winston. Yes, the past is more important, said O'Brien seriously. They finished the wine and a moment later Julia stood up to go. When she had left, Winston stood up and he and O'Brien shook hands. At the door he looked back. But O'Brien was already at his desk, doing his important work for the party. Chapter 8 Doublethink On the sixth day of hate week, just before 2,000 Eurasian prisoners were hanged in the park, the people of Oceania were told that they were not at war with Eurasia now. They were at war with East Asia and Eurasia was a friend. You could hear it on the telescreens, Oceania was at war with East Asia, Oceania had always been at war with East Asia. Winston had worked more than 90 hours in the last five days of hate week. Now he had finished and he had nothing to do. No party work until tomorrow morning. Slowly, in the afternoon sunshine, he walked up a narrow street to Mr. Charrington's shop, watching for the Thorpe police, but sure, although he had no reason to be sure, that he was safe. In his case, heavy against his legs, he carried the book, Goldstein's book. He had had it for six days but had not looked at it yet, tired but not sleepy, he climbed the stairs above Mr. Charrington's shop. He opened the window and put the water on for coffee. Julia would be here soon. He took Goldstein's book out of his case and opened it. Then he heard Julia coming up the stairs and jumped out of his chair to meet her. She put her brown tool back on the floor and threw herself into his arms. It was more than a week since they had seen each other. I've got the book, he said. Oh, you've got it. Good, she said without much interest, and almost immediately bent down to make the coffee. They did not talk about the book again until they had been in bed for half an hour. It was evening and just cool enough to have a blanket over them. Julia was falling asleep by his side. Winston picked the book up from the floor and sat up in bed. We must read it, he said. You too. All members of the Brotherhood have to read it, you read it, 
she said with her eyes shut. Read it to me, that's the best way. Then you can explain it to me, the clock's hand said six, meaning eighteen. They had three or four hours ahead of them. He put the book against his knee and began reading. There have always been three kinds of people in the world, the high, the middle and the low. The world has changed but society always contains these three groups. Julia, are you awake? said Winston. Yes, my love, I'm listening. The aims of the three groups are completely different. The high want to stay where they are. The middle want to change places with the high. Sometimes the low have no aim at all, because they are too tired from endless boring work to have an aim. If they do have one, they want to live in a new world where all people are equal. At the beginning of the 20th century, this equality became possible for the first time because machines did so much of the work. A centuries old dream seemed to become true. But in the early 1930s the high group saw the danger to them of equality for all and did everything possible to stop it. The individual suffered in ways that he had not suffered for centuries. Prisoners of war were sent into slavery or hanged. Thousands were sent to prison although they had broken no law. The populations of whole countries were forced to leave their homes. And all this was defended and even supported by people who said they believed in progress. The people who entered the new high group were from the professions, scientists, teachers, journalists. They used newspapers, radio, film and television to control people's thoughts. When a television that could both send and receive information was invented, private life came to an end. Every individual, or at least every important individual, could be watched 24 hours a day. For the first time it was possible to force people to obey the party and to share the party's opinion on all subjects. After the 1950s and 1960s the danger of equality had been ended and society had regrouped itself. As always, into high, middle and low. But the new high group, for the first time, knew how to stay in that position forever, first, in the middle years of the 20th century. The party made sure that it owned all the property, all the factories, land, houses, everything except really small pieces of personal property. This meant that a few people, the inner party, owned almost everything and the middle and low groups owned nearly nothing. There was therefore no hope of moving up in society by becoming richer and earning more. But the problem of staying in power is more complicated than that. In the past, high groups have fallen from power either because they have lost control of the middle or low groups or because they have become too weak, or because they have been attacked and beaten by an army from outside. After the middle of the century there was really no more danger from the middle or low groups. The party had made itself stronger by killing all of its first leaders, people like Jones, Aronson and Rutherford. By 1970 Big Brother was the only leader and Emmanuel Goldstein was in hiding somewhere, 
the party then kept itself strong. The child of inner party parents is not born into the inner party. There is an examination, taken at the age of 16. Weak inner party members are moved down and clever outer party members are allowed to move up. Although proles do not usually move up into the party, the party always stops itself from becoming stupid or weak. The party has also made attack from the outside impossible. There are now only three great countries in the world. They are always at war, but none of them can win or even wishes to win these wars. Following the idea of doublethink, the mind of the party, which controls us all, both knows and does not know the aim of these wars. The aim is to use everything that a country produces without making its people richer. If people became richer, there would be an end to the world of the high, the middle and the low. The low and the middle would not wish to stay in their places and would not need to. The middle and low are kept in their places by their belief in the wars that none of the three countries can win. So the party has to end independent thought and make people believe everything they are told. The party must know what every person is thinking, so they never want to end the war. War continues, always and forever. People are given somewhere to live, something to wear and something to eat. That is all they need and they must never want more. They are given work, but only the thought police do their work really well. All good things in the world of Oceania today, all knowledge, all happiness, come from Big Brother. Nobody has ever seen Big Brother. He is a face on posters, a voice on the telescreen. We can be sure that he will never die. Big Brother is the way the party shows itself to the people. Below Big Brother comes the inner party, which is now six million people, less than two percent of the population of Oceania. Below the inner party comes the outer party. The inner party is like the mind of the party and the outer party is like its hands. Below that come the millions of people we call the proles, about 85% of the population. A party member lives under the eye of the thought police from birth to death. Even when he is alone he can never be sure he is alone. He will never make a free choice in his life. But there is no law and there are no rules. They are not necessary. Most people know what they must do. In Newspeak they are good thinkers. And since party members were children they have been trained in three more Newspeak words. Crime Stop, Black White and a double think. Even young children are taught crime stop. It means stopping before you think a wrong thought. When you are trained in crime stop, you cannot think a thought against the party. You think only what the party wants you to think. But the party wants people to think different thoughts all the time. The important word here is black-white. Like many newspeak words, this has two meanings. Enemies say that black is white, they tell lies. But party members say that black is white because the party tells them to and because they believe it.
they must forget that they ever had a different belief. Black white and crime stop are both part of a double think. Double think allows people to hold two different ideas in their minds at the same time and to accept both of them. In this way they can live with a changing reality including a changing past. The past must be changed all the time because the party can never make a mistake. That is the most important reason. It is also important that nobody can remember a time better than now and so become unhappy with the present. By using doublethink the party has been able to stop history, keep power and Julia. No answer, Julia, are you awake? No answer. She was asleep. He shut the book, put it carefully on the floor, lay down and put the blanket over both of them. The book had not told him anything he did not already know, but after reading it he knew he was not mad. He shut his eyes. He was safe, everything was all right. When he woke he thought he had slept a long time, but, looking at the old clock, he saw it was only 20.30. Outside he could hear singing. It was a song written in the Ministry of Truth and a parole woman was singing it. If there was hope, thought Winston, it was because of the proles. Even without reading the end of Goldstein's book, he knew that was his message. The future belonged to the proles, party members were the dead, we are the dead, he said. We are the dead, agreed Julia, you are the dead, said a voice behind them they jumped away from each other. Winston felt his blood go cold. Julia's face had turned a milky yellow. You are the dead, repeated the voice, it was behind the picture, breathed Julia, it was behind the picture, said the voice. Stay exactly where you are. Do not move until we order you to. It was starting, it was starting at last. They could do nothing except look into each other's eyes. They did not even think of running for their lives or getting out of the house before it was too late. It was unthinkable to disobey the voice from the wall, there was a crash of breaking glass. The picture had fallen to the floor. There was a telescreen behind it, now they can see us, said Julia. Now we can see you, said the voice. Stand in the middle of the room. Stand back to back. Put your hands behind your heads. Do not touch each other, I suppose we should say goodbye, said Julia. You should say goodbye, said the voice, there was a crash as a ladder broke through the window. Soldiers came in, more came crashing in through the door. Winston did not move, not even his eyes. Only one thing mattered, don't give them an excuse to hit you. Point one of the soldiers hit Julia hard in the stomach. She fell to the floor, fighting to breathe. Then two of them picked her up and carried her out of the room, holding her by the knees and shoulders. Winston saw her face, yellow with pain with her eyes tightly shut as they took her away from him. He did not move. No one had hit him yet. He wondered if they had got Mr. Charrington. 
He wanted to go to the toilet. The clock said nine, meaning twenty-one hours, but the light seemed too strong for evening. Was it really nine in the morning? Had he and Julia slept all that time I suppose we should say goodbye. Mr. Charrington came into the room and Winston suddenly realized whose voice he had heard on the telescreen. Mr. Charrington still had his old jacket on, but his hair, which had been almost white, was now black. His body was straighter and looked bigger. His face was the clear-thinking, cold face of a man of about thirty-five. Winston realized that for the first time in his life he was looking at a member of the Thorpe Police.